Welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast. I'm your host, Angel Renee, joined in studio by the lovely Christine Steinberg. Hi. And Miss Brittany Brodmacher. Am I not lovely? Of course you are. Oh. Hey, I'm getting a little insecure and jealous over here. You're both lovely. <laughs> but what you. about Big Daddy over here? Big Papa Daddy? Joe? You mean our Alexa Ray stand-in? So Alexa Ray sadly cannot be with us this week. Um, She sends her regrets. She picked up the con flu. I actually con strep from New York Comic Con. So she is recovering at home, keeping her germies far away from us. She was like, I can still come over. And we were like, no. No. (laughs) We love you, girl. We miss your husband of talk, but but we do not want your strep throat. (laughs) Um, For those of you who are new to our show, welcome. Thank you so much for joining the What's Good Games podcast, where we talk about video games and other cool, nerdy stuff. Movies, TV, some other, you know, weird, random conversation. Maybe we're going to talk about how the eyes on the pumpkin that Britt painted continually creep me out. Well, it's because they're on two different levels. Yes, it's like they're like the pure definition of googly eyes. They're perfect imperfections. That's not how that works no. generally. Ugh. But but, that- I, but it's a it's a masterpiece to behold. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you missed our Patreon exclusive video where we painted our Halloween pumpkins, you can head on over to patreon.com slash what's good games to check it out. Did you know that for as little as one dollar you can get access to exclusive videos, uh, behind-the-scenes photos, some fun common threads. We have a, a great community we do. over we on really our Patreon do. page. Andrea, so. where can people see these googly eyes on this pumpkin? YouTube.com. YouTube.com. Slash what's, what's good, good games. games. Yes, that's right. If you what were you listening. Well, if you're listening on iTunes. Oh, yeah. No, no. What I meant was if um, if you want to watch the process of them being the pumpkin made. Video. But oh. if you are listening to us uh, on podcast services um, all over the world and instead are like, hmm, I need to see these weird pumpkins for myself. Yes. YouTube.com slash what's good games. Please subscribe. We would appreciate that. Um, so we're all in town here because we're working on a top secret project that we're hopefully going to announce soon. But we also are traveling together this weekend to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Hey, yeah. Steimer, where are we going? To XPO or just Expo in Tulsa. Which That's I don't know. <laughs> What's in Tulsa besides this expo? I'm hoping good food. (laughs) I've gotten some recommendations from some folks that live in Tulsa, but if you are in the area and you haven't heard yet, it's um, expotulsa.com. So that's expotulsa.com is where you can get all of the information on tickets, on the schedule. We have a variety of panels that are happening on Saturday, October 14th. Um, I'm in one in the morning, the girls are in one in the afternoon, and then our panel, our What's Good Games panel, is at 4.45 Central Time, I believe. Yeah, sounds about right. Sure. Yep. (laughs) Sounds good. We're highly organized over here, everybody. (laughs) I I just live my life by my calendar. I show it, I get the notifications, and then I go to where I'm supposed to go. There's been a lot going on. Yeah, it's been a very, very busy couple of weeks. I just got back from New York. I was at the Nintendo World Championships Woo! 2017. You yeah, weren't girl. just there, girl. You were hosting that thing. Yes. You guys, it was it was so much fun getting to work with Nintendo on that project and getting to meet all of the competitors and he- hearing, you know, John Number's story. And some of the kids in the 12 and under category were just so precious and s- so enthusiastic and just happy to be there and also incredibly good at video games um there was a a a young a young boy in the 15 plus excuse me in the 13 plus category kyle who has like six different mario kart world records what and we were all just hanging out in the new york nintendo store one night and they have some kiosks for some games set up there that you can play and he was like of course he's gonna play the mario kart station and i watched him and he set a new record at the store while we were all watching him 
I, I was, was just like, I was blown away. I mean, I was happy to get like fifth place in Mario Kart when I was that age, let alone set a record. That's insane. Yeah, it was it was <laughs> nuts. So we all had to take photos of it that he set this record. But what was really cool about the competition, so there were five separate stages, a finals round, and then the grand finals. Um, they played all kinds of games, a shield surfing in Zelda Breath of the Wild. They did Birds and Beans, which is a, it was a weird DS game. They did Tetris in the Underground. They had Super Smash Bros. Of course, that made an appearance, Mario Kart. But the Super Mario Maker custom level that the Treehouse staff put together for the competition was particularly brutal. But John Numbers just whizzed right through it and then in the final round it was down between him and Ito otherwise known as um uh Thomas G and so Ito is a is a Evo player smash player Mm -hmm. and John numbers the reigning championship so it came down to the two of them and they played of course Super Mario Odyssey just like the wizard when they played Super Mario Brothers 3 and so it was a really great crowd moment and at that time we'd been going for over four hours <laughs> like the time. longest competition ever um, and then Thomas reigned victorious so he was um, a very gracious winner he is um, he's known as being like a, a forever runner up like always a bridesmaid <laughs> kind Aww. of a deal and so when he actually won he was like pretty stunned uh, and very humble about it which was cool he's a nice kid but if you guys want to check out any of the competition it's on nintendo's youtube channel the entire broadcast is there um i also have it on my website andrewrenee.com so you also got a kicking sweatshirt from it i saw you wearing last night oh yeah and i it was, was like <laughs> i'm a little jealous <laughs> what's so was, kicking it's um i don't know Okay. Kicking's good. It's a, a hoodie. It's a Nintendo World Championships 2017 um, exclusive piece of merchandise that they were only selling at the Nintendo New York store. So they had a t-shirt, a long sleeve tee, and the hoodie. And I was like, which which of these am I going to wear the most? Definitely the hoodie. Mm. So. Well, you had to buy it? Yeah. <laughs> they didn't give you one for hosting? They, they, <laughs> gave, they gave them all to the contestants. But, I mean, I was happy to buy it. If I had asked, they probably would have given me one. But I bought a bunch of other um tees and things like that and so i was like you know like i'm happy to support nintendo okay they flew me out there yeah that's true (laughs) um but i had a lot of fun and um hopefully you guys will check it out and if not i don't blame you it's long it happened but we do have yeah Yeah. (laughs) i saw that timer (laughs) we do have some news to actually talk about we'll get to it right now um so there are some almost uh, controversial is maybe the right word to talk about some of the news that's happening this week. Um, The first story has been a pretty hot button issue for a lot of gamers and it's all about loot boxes. Mm -hmm. So there's been many stories coming out about AAA games that are $60 price point that are incorporating various states of loot boxes. And because of that, um, Kotaku did some digging and, On their article, they found out that the ESRB, the ratings board that puts out self-regulatory ratings for parents so that they know kind of what the content is of these games, has come out to officially say that loot boxes are not gambling. So the story reads, over the past few weeks, as randomized loot boxes have dominated the conversation surrounding this fall's video games, there have been calls for the Entertainment Software Ratings Board to classify them as gambling in its back-of-the-box ratings. But the ESRB says that's not going to happen because, according to a spokesperson, loot boxes don't fit the bill. ESRB does not consider loot boxes to be gambling, said an ESRB spokesperson in an email to Kotaku. While there's an element of chance in these mechanics, the player is always guaranteed to receive in-game content, even if the player unfortunately receives something they don't want. We think of it as a similar principle to collectible card games sometimes you'll open a pack and get a brand new holographic card you've had your eye on for a while but other times you'll end up with a pack of cards you already have the esrb has categories for both real gambling and simulated gambling according to their criteria real gambling is any sort of wager involving real cash while simulated gambling means that the player can gamble without betting or wagering real cash or currency The spokesperson added that any game with real gambling will always receive an adults-only rating, which would be poisonous for big publishers, as most big box retailers will not sell AO games in their stores. Many of this fall's games, including Shadow of War, Destiny 2, and the upcoming Star Wars Battlefront 2, feature systems in which you can spend money to get randomized gear in the form of loot boxes. Woo! Yeah, I mean, this is actually even... I didn't read the entire article, but just reading the headlines, 
I immediately said exactly what they did, which is like, well, technically collectible card games aren't gambling either. Right. And mm -hmm. otherwise you're classifying what, like when we were children playing Pokemon trading cards, we were gambling. Like, no, it's not. <laughs> like, right. So yeah. I get it. It doesn't make any sense to label it that way. I see why people want some sort of a, not a warning, but like well, something indication that right. there is that element in there, especially if you're giving it to a child. Cause if you've got your accounts hooked up, and like, I don't know, maybe people don't it, monitor their children that well, basically is what I'm saying. And so like you can end up spending more money than you intended. I can understand why people would want a warning or they would want something to be classified because I feel like in a sense, not all, but some are probably preying off the fact that it is an addictive mechanic. You know, you do put the money forward and you are getting items and what, how, what, What's the the word you use in Destiny? The uh, baby the, grind? No, 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 no. The loot, the loot retrieval. The R and Jesus. R and Jesus. There Sorry, you yeah. go. That's you pray to R and Jesus. R and Jesus. <laughs> and maybe you know the R and Jesus isn't feeling very generous that day, or maybe R and Jesus has another god that's telling him, "No, you're going to make this extremely hard to get this day." I don't know. So I understand, but it's uh, it's a tricky, it's a, it's a tricky thing, and it's also. I I under I completely understand why it's in every game now because. Uh, working where I've worked and I won't say where, but like it, it makes more money than you would be disgusted by the amount of money it makes. Uh, let me tell you, let me tell you a little bit about how much money it makes <sighs> and that make you go on the spot there, Steimer. Um, so a friend of mine and a friend of the show at agent Tinsley on Twitter tweeted out recently. And I was talking about this on um, games daily as well, but she had a tweet that said, wait, if people hate loot boxes and DLC, then why do they keep buying it? And she attached a few headline photos, like screenshots of articles. The first one says GTA Online's $500 million in microtransactions could mean a very different GTA 6. Another headline, EA makes $1.3 billion a year on extra content. But define extra content. One more, okay. Activision Blizzard made over $3.6 billion from in-game content sales in 2016. So we don't know what the definition of the microtransactions specifically in for these publishers but these numbers are giant yes right particularly the activision blizzard number calling out specifically in-game sales extra content for for ea probably includes dlc meaning large content down to like a single costume for a game right and the sims has a bunch of like add-on stuff you can oh, buy yeah. and the sims is outrageous all, all kinds <laughs> of stuff so i mean but extra content downloadable content uh, whether it be in-game, you have to buy it separately in the store, whether it be a microtransaction or a major season pass. It's become very commonplace now with, with AAA games. And it really started with free-to-play games saying, well, we need to find a way to pay for this the development of this game. And so we have to charge you incrementally for something in the game. Right. And now it's spilled over into games, into AAA games. Because the, the the publishers are saying, well, we're just leaving money on the table by not offering these things to players. Because clearly, based off these numbers, <laughs> players are buying. Oh, absolutely. And so what's tough for me is that I am not universally against loot boxes or microtransactions. I'm all about player choice. Let people decide how yeah. they want to spend their own money. However, it becomes problematic. And we've talked about this on the show before. When developers or publishers specifically are influencing the way that devs are creating the infrastructure in their game in order to incentivize people to buy additional content mm -hmm. by gating content they otherwise would have offered as part of the base package price and saying instead you know we're going to siphon that off and charge you for it and then GameStop with that tweet today. Oh, my gosh. That was, yeah. Oh, that was so bad. <sighs> In case you missed it, they made what they thought was a cheeky joke about gating content behind a paywall for Assassin's Creed. And instead, it came off as like, oh, hey, yeah, that's right. You're gating content behind a paywall. Yeah. yeah um, so mm. this is clearly a complicated issue. How do you ladies feel about microtransactions? Um, I'm like you. I'm all for player choice. It isn't. We're all not all, but you know, we're adults. We can make our own decisions. We can spend our money the way we want to spend it. If you are a parent and you have your child, if your child has access to your funds and can buy all the loot boxes, that's on you. But you know, we can make our own decisions. I'm in, in complete agreement with you that if I just read an article today briefly that. Supposedly, toward the end of Shadow of War, it's very, very difficult, and it turns into a grind 
a grind quest. Yeah, grind, grind fest. fest. Thank you. And or, or both. Or both. Could be a quest of grinding. Go on a quest of grind. <laughs> and so people are saying, like, you know, you have to essentially, you can either grind for a gajillion hours or you can put money into these loot boxes and loot chests and get the true ending. I don't know what that necessarily means, but a lot of people it's are It's an extra it. ending. I don't know if it's necessarily the true one, but yeah, you get a special ending or something. That's messed up. It's, I don't, I, I mean, yeah. In a more simpler way, I sort of rephrasing what Andrea said. I don't like it when you right. design a sixty dollars game as a as a free to play game. That's where it it turns into an issue, and you need to make sure that your game is balanced properly. And like, and I know this is going to sound dirty, but like, and the grinding is balanced properly. <laughs> <laughs> but because you don't want to end up with that Shadow of War feeling, mm-hmm. where you're like, man, this is just tedious. And I want to kind of skip this, skip this content. And the easiest way to do that might be to pop like an extra $10 into this thing. Now, I will say on the other side of it, games are more expensive than ever now to develop. And they haven't changed from $60 in a very long time. So they haven't. So in a way, I'm not, I'm not fully against them whatsoever, because I do think developers need to be creative and find new ways to make money that isn't upping the price of games, because I don't know. That any of like we would all be like, Ugh, if games were all of a sudden, hey, now it's a hundred dollars. Like, sorry, that would be a a, a pretty big I jump. Mean, I would, mean, I think if we went from fifty nine ninety nine to say like, like sixty five ninety nine, you know, like or even seventy nine ninety nine. I mean, a lot of deluxe editions now start at eighty mm-hmm. or ninety bucks, but and they give you hot garbage usually. Yeah, it's a bunch of a bunch of in game digital stuff that you use for like a couple hours, and you're like, then you throw it away. You're like, this is worthless. Yeah. Um, Oops. but <laughs> I guess it depends on the game. Okay, <laughs> let's not get in. Let's not get in the nitty gritty of like, you know, breaking down my analysis. There, here's here's my point. <laughs> The point is, I agree with you, Steimer. I think that game development is expensive. We need to talk about funding game development. I think, though, when we see these headlines about EA making an extra $1.3 billion in content and how many AAA games that could fund the development of, it's, it's, it's kind of a tough pill for a lot of gamers to swallow. And I think what we really need to do is just have some... I mean, there's now going to be um, a website called open critic if you guys are familiar with them mm-hmm. um they have come forward to say that they're going to begin tracking all microtransactions in games so that way we can at least have some kind of oversight into who's doing what how much does it cost what exactly does it give you what is the progression that's locked behind mm-hmm. the loot boxes what items are because that's the first step in you know transparency because right. otherwise it's it might go as far as what china is doing where they require pay to win. Well, well, they also requ- but they require the publishers to disclose what the drop rates are. Oh, they do. Yeah. So, th- because gambling is such an epidemic in China, all of the gambling, whether it be loot boxes or microtransactions, whatever, if there's any kind of RNG element to it, they have to disclose what the drop rates are. Mm. How so benevolent th- is your RNG? <laughs> RNG. So they have to make it publicly available for people who are like, well, I want to know what the drop rate is for this one box. And it could be like, oh, it's like one in 36 or whatever mm-hmm. the rates are. So that's mm-hmm. not the case here in the United States or in other countries that I'm aware of. But if you live in a country where that's the case, please write in. Um, to contact at whatsgoodgames.com and let us know. Um, hmm. But um, we're, I think we're probably going to approach it soon just because of how strict, you know, the FTC is becoming when cracking down on video games overall. So I have to imagine that, like, it can't, this can't go on unchecked forever. Yeah, it's been interesting to see the explosion of it because this has been around in the sports games for a while, like FIFA. FIFA has used essentially card packs for a while like several years and then i think eventually somebody at ea was like wait a minute we make a lot of money on these things why don't we try putting this in some of our other games and then everyone was like wait wait a minute wait yeah look at all that money over there i want some of that money like and so now we're seeing that and we're as that tweet shows like you can't blame them for wanting to pick up more money off the table. These are businesses at the end of the day. Yeah. And so yeah. I think the the line will just need to be drawn somewhere where it feels um, like 
they're taking advantage of players versus it's like a fun thing exactly and i think transparency is what players want more than anything because you know it's you have these micro transactions and you have the loot chest and you have these exclusive pre-order bonuses and i think yeah it's like we just want to know you what are we getting what are our odds like otherwise it can feel like you're just getting dicked around a little bit may the odds be ever in your favor (laughs) (laughs) Oh. Pardon me, I'm opening it like, a, a refreshing Diet, Diet Coke. Coke. Not, not sponsored. <laughs> hey, if Diet I, Coke wants to sponsor Could they please the sponsor them? them? Do you know how much Diet Coke we go through in this house? It's a crime. I do. I've seen the cans. <laughs> <laughs> I put I put a 12-pack in the fridge two days later. I'm like, John, where's the Diet Coke? Gone. Kind of like me and your bottled water. Yes. Yes, but water is healthy for you to drink in that quantity. <laughs> True. <laughs> um. Okay. We could probably go on about this. And we, here's the thing. This is going to be part of the conversation through the next couple of months as we see how these loot boxes play out. Middle Earth Shadow of War was just released this week. I've only spent about 30 minutes with that game, so I have no idea how the loot boxes actually function. Mm-hmm. And I think very few people have gotten deep enough into the game where they can see, like, end level. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. Steimer, get your head out Sorry. of there. Not everything is that that's what she said. I know. Um, it, but Where we, you know, a story came out this week um, on Reddit saying that there were leaks that it's going to be in Call of Duty World War II zombies. Um, we're hearing about it in Battlefront, too. But so, I'm not surprised, especially in a multiplayer game, that's kind of where they fit the best. Right, right, right. But, like, here's the thing. Um, those games aren't just multiplayer games anymore. Both of those games have campaigns. So, like... I think we're going to shelve it for now since we don't know how the boxes work in either of those games specifically, unless you do. But, well, no, but my point is, like, this is not a new thing. Like, Mass Effect did this exact same thing. Mass Effect had a single-player campaign, and the multiplayer had card packs. Same thing with Dragon Age. Like, that, this is not... It's new maybe to those franchises, but it's not, like, a new concept that a game would have a single-player campaign and then have card packs available for the multiplayer portion no totally and i think the reason why people are upset and i agree with you i'm not mad about it i think it comes down to the reason i was upset about what destiny 2 was doing in these previous versions of these franchises they gave these things not locked behind loot boxes and now they're locking things behind loot boxes Mm -hmm. and it's not like it's a new game or a new thing right from what i've heard from people it's stuff that was included before that's Mm. now being like you know locked behind a paywall put it in a box so that's why people are upset um okay moving on uh the next story we want to talk about is how respawn entertainment announced that they will be working on an oculus rift vr game titanfall developers respawn entertainment have thrown their hat in the vr ring promising a shooter (laughs) for 2019 The announcement was made at the Oculus Connect event this week and on a blog post on the studio's website. So we all watched the little video. Mm -hmm. um, The talking head video. Yeah, with all the teammates from Respawn and basically talking about their history in making video games and why they wanted to make this project and if they were going to do it, they were going to do it right. And I thought it was a really interesting concept. I mean, Respawn makes great games. Mm -hmm. Um, They clearly have a pedigree, you know, coming from... Um, Infinity Ward, and then with Titanfall that we've seen so far, they also have a Star Wars game that's in the pipeline for them. And so the idea that they're going to be partnering with Oculus specifically to make a VR game, um, I think is really exciting. I think people who are big fans of VR or maybe are interested in VR are looking for something of that caliber, for a studio of that caliber to make something a little bit more robust than these what seems to be like 15 to 30 minute experiences that we're Mm -hmm. getting instead of actual full-fledged games. Um, Would a game from Respawn entice either of you ladies to get VR? Yeah, I mean, I have VR. I have all the VRs. Um, She's got all the VRs. I got all of the VRs. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, so when VR first came out, I was all aboard that hype train. I got the Rift, I have PSVR, I have whatever the other one, Vive. Um, But yeah, it was kind of like what you said, Andrew. They're all just more experiences than anything. So it's fun for a bit, and I love horror on VR. It's phenomenal, and maybe one of these days I can get one of you guys to do it with me. Uh, (laughs) Oh, it's so good. (laughs) Um, But yeah, where I found like I was uncomfortable because I have to wear this headset, and it's not that heavy, but there's all these cords, not to mention if you don't have the PC for it, it's just inaccessible, blah, blah, blah. And a shooter isn't really what I'm looking for, but I am very, very interested because this is going to be probably like a triple A. Like I think um, 
Respawn got their Rift gear in 2013. So if this does come out in 2019, this will be a six-year development cycle. So I think we can as assume it's going to be a full-fledged boom game that you would expect. So that is very exciting. I like VR. I like what it means for the future of immersion in video games. I don't know if it's where it needs to be right now, but this can only help. Do you think 2019 is too far? Do you think that that's too much in the distance for people who need VR content now? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So th the thing is, like, I don't think VR has taken off like anyone really thought it would. So you have to ask, is one real big AAA awesome, which probably be a phenomenal game, is that really going to sell the VR units? Granted, we'll talk about this in a bit. Oculus has announced a price cut. They are coming out with little mini versions of VR. But for now, it's... It's VR is not where it needs to be, and I think that's more of the cock block than anything. Yeah, let's talk about that price cut. So it was also announced at the Connect event that the Oculus Go is a new version coming for one hundred ninety nine dollars, so half the price of the um, Oculus Rift VR, which is now you know being bundled. So at this um, announcement, it says that this headset will be a standalone VR headset that doesn't require a PC to run and comes with a single palm controller that's different than the touch controller. Now, they haven't offered any more details other than that, uh, just so as that they're coming. The software. Right. So the mm -hmm. big question that a lot of, you know, VR enthusiasts and, you know, people who cover this from a, a reporting standpoint are kind of asking, what could possibly be the difference in content that you're talking about a half price piece of hardware? Because the Rift right now is selling for three ninety nine, and it includes the headset, two sensors, touch controllers, and a handful of games. So, I mean... To save two hundred bucks, you're going down to the port. Now, the be it being portable, I think is huge, and I think that there's a big reason why VR hasn't taken off, and a lot of that has to do with what you mentioned, mm -hmm. the lack of you know compelling content. Number one, if you don't have good software, the hardware doesn't make a difference how cool and fancy it is, and two, that fact you have to have a a very high powered PC to run the thing. Mm -hmm. um, PlayStation P or uh, PlayStation VR, obviously very plug and play with the PS4. However, they also don't have a lot of content offerings that are super enticing to a wider audience. I mean, they've done a pretty great job. Last time I checked on numbers, I believe PSVR had the highest uh, unit sales of all the three VR platforms. So good on PlayStation for recognizing that people want, you know, something that's less complicated than, you know, the setups that Vive and Oculus have. But, you know, like... Yeah, it's tough because when, I remember when VR first was shown, I was like, this is really cool. The gaming community is not ready for this. Right. Like, it's just, it's too early. The hardware is cool. And there's a few hand, like a handful of really great games. But overall, there's just, it's just not, it doesn't justify its price. Here's a thought. Do you think VR will ever be able to adapt to the quote, hardcore gaming community? Or do you think it's always going to be more of your casual experiences? Oh, I definitely think they will. And I think Eve Valkyrie is a good example of that. I mean, that is a very intense, like, hardcore PC game that was designed specifically for VR. Did anybody just drop the VR on that? This is, it's possible now to not play with VR, I believe. Right. No, they, they made a different version because so many of their fans were like, I want to play this, but I don't have VR. So they've put out another way to play. They didn't. They didn't drop it. Yeah, I got confused they, for a second. I was like, Yeah, that was what? a little dramatic <laughs> of a word choice. Um. But um, I, th I think that that's the kind of game that a lot of, you know, like PC enthusiasts really wanted to play, like this mm -hmm. like space combat sim kind of experience. It's not for me personally, um, but I don't know. I just, 2019 feels so far away. I'm just, yeah. I mean, <laughs> Here I, hate, it comes. I hate to live up to my name. No, the it's salts, fine. Bring I on just, the salts, timer. For me, I'm like, none of this, it will be... Like I I will live for the day when somebody finally convinces me to, that VR is worth my time. Like, you like I cool just story, bro? I just don't. I'm like, okay, cool. They're making a game for something that I don't care about. Like I don't care about VR. I don't know why I would care about VR. To me, like I don't the experience of it, and I've tried it before. It's just not interesting enough to me to want to ever buy an extra thing for my house. Maybe if it's like contact lenses one day. And you like just pop them in your eyes and like then maybe we'll talk. But so like in a hundred years. So like in a hundred years, I'll be all for 
VR. But for right now, when I've got to put something on my face, I don't want to do that. And it's like for me, it's very similar to a uh, rock band or any or like DJ here. Whenever you have a peripheral, I'm just that's an extra step I'm not going to take to play your game. That's it's just too much for me, and I don't wow. like it in my house. Okay, Damn, I don't like it. Okay, <laughs> okay. So what if, what if Bioware like release something with something Dragon Age related or Mass Effect related? Would mm. that's not even enough? Like it's literally just like the wall of the peripheral on your face is like no, not happening. It's just not something that I really I'm um, no. Okay. I mean, it depends on what I mean. If it's like love simulator. <laughs> well, no, it's interesting, but, it's not, but no, because I feel like no. a lot of people probably share the same feelings that you do where i'm like i'm all about it i mean i haven't played vr in a very long time but i i appreciate it and i like the immersion of it and i do think it's a really cool experience but for someone like you who has absolutely no interest i'm curious like what would it take do you know what it would take for you to be like turned on to it that's i think it's really just it going down to like one day it's contact lenses or one day it's like something that's not wearing a box on your face because I just like <laughs> I mean <laughs> because I, 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 I don't know to me it's just that's not what I want to do when I come home from work so at the end of the day it's not about the content it's about the accessibility it's about the way you play it and and I yeah and I also think the content's not very good right now sure. but I mean I'm but sure one like day that will change okay. but today is not that day interesting okay fair enough well, there isn't really a whole lot of other news to talk about. A lot of games got updates. We did see um, PUBG, Player Unknown Battlegrounds, cross two pretty significant milestones. They hit over 2 million concurrence on Steam, which has now set the all time highest record of any game on Steam. Damn. Which is crazy. Yeah. Um and I've been going back and forth with the KFGD team about whether or not this should be considered for game of the year. And I was like, no, it's early access. It's not even finished yet. Of course it can't be. But they're like, it's such a phenomenon. Where do you ladies stand on this on this debate? Yeah, because once it because I think there's a lot of people that feel the same way you do. And once it does become an official game, then it'll just win that next year anyway. Probably. It's very likely. They're pro- Maybe they're doing that so they can I mean, be nominated. This has been a phenomenal. A sorry. There's been a fen- this has been a phenomenal year for gaming. So if PUBG is going to like best everything or sh- it could best everything of this year, I can't see how next year would stack up to this year. So I could just see it winning again. I don't think it could be best of all things. Like, it can be best online game or something, you know, best You don't think it would get, like, overall game of everything of the year of the world made a whoa. <laughs> that should be a real whoa. award. <laughs> I just want to say that they've crossed over 15 million copies sold and since yesterday. So we're recording the show on Wednesday. Yesterday when I did the news, they were at 14.9. So they've sold over 500,000 copies in less than 24 hours. <laughs> this game is Hotcakes McGee. Everybody wants it. Well, and it's at a magic price point of twenty nine ninety nine. It's because not finished yet. Although I'm confused. <laughs> right. No, thank you. It's not finished yet it's not done and i'm not saying it's not cool i'm not saying it's not fun and it's not like a good time but it's not a done game but have they said what what and or when it will no longer be quote unquote early access or is this early access really just them so that they can cover their ass with any bugs well, we know that it's going that when it releases on Xbox One later this fall, that it's going to be released as early game preview, right? So it's not going to be a full retail release or even a full digital release, like a finalized game um, when it launches. And so I have to imagine that they're going to come into at least what open beta <laughs> um, <laughs> next year <laughs> um, with a full launch happening mid year to late year. Would be my guess. Um, I would. I would. I think holiday next year would be a good time for them to have like a box on the shelf, right? So maybe by this time next year. Wow. Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like this could have been one of those games that just never left a state of quote unquote early access because they wouldn't need to. But and I'm trying to think. Like, do they need a box on a shelf at this? No point? need. No. But we were talking about this. But want yes because think about some games that added retail way later like rocket league they sold millions more copies 
because they were at retail because a parent walking into a store that saw the game they're like oh i think my kid was talking about that people still go to the mall yes yes they do they (laughs) They absolutely do (laughs) and some people will also buy the copy more than once if like the the retail edition is like a special edition that comes with um in-game content or if it's a comes a collector's edition like look at cuphead it was released and now they the studio announced they're going to be working on a retail physical collector's edition after launch because they want to make some cool toys to go with their game and they know that people will buy it Mm -hmm. you were not used to that order but it does happen Yeah. yeah And think about all the exclusive pre-order bonuses, too. You might have to buy a physical item. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) Can you even pre-order a game that's already been released? I guess technically you can. If there's a collector's edition and it's very limited, you better run now, children, and buy it. Go. Yeah, That's but um, I just wanted to mention that, um, and we um we played a little bit of Fortnite's Battle Royale. They had a big milestone as well. They hit um three point six seven million players last weekend with over five hundred thousand, five hundred and fifty thousand, some over five hundred thousand concurrent players. Um, wow. which is well, they clearly are coming for for PUBG. Oh yeah. Um, and once they are, you know, once it releases, once um, PUBG releases on console, it'll be interesting to see how those two um, duke it out. But we're going to talk about our impressions of that game because we we dabbled a little bit in it in the next section. Do you know um, what Fortnite's numbers were before they released Battle Royale? Like, did this save their game? I believe that Epic never announced which to me indicates not so great. No, not necessarily. I'm just saying. I may not have, saying that they're like <laughs> I in the weeds. I I heard but. from some anonymous sources and I'm not saying where these sources came from. They came from the sky. From the sky. <laughs> that the game was doing quite well. Oh. All right. That so, kind of surprises me, but that's good to know. Well, here's the thing. Sometimes if a game does well, we don't know if that means it sold a lot of base units, mm-hmm. if it has a lot of concurrent players, or if they're making a crap ton in microtransactions. True. So generally, you can have a small but very um, spendy active. Base. <laughs> spendy people active. Would, people with deep pockets. So, <laughs> yeah. so we don't know what their install base was prior or daily to daily active users or anything. Right. So they didn't release that information. But maybe the people that were playing were just smashing llamas all day long oh like I mean, it's who else fun. yeah <laughs> so yeah. and um i mean we we've had a great time yeah and having uh, i have in addition so epic provided us with uh founders pack codes so we were able to test out the game and have them come here and do the stream and everything but since then i have spent my own personal money buying llamas because oh, Oh yes, girl. <laughs> I have not. I am. Su- I'm super stingy. Like, I will not. I will just not buy out of spite for That's the most okay. part. Uh, it takes a lot to get me to to put a credit card into any I of the hope games. Someday I can find something that brings me as much joy as llamas bring to Andrea. The look and the grin on her face <laughs> when she's about to whack a llama, and like the <laughs> chuckle that comes out of her mouth is just like demonic. It's great. You, you get to tickle them first, and then, <laughs> you, and then murder and then them. You smash them. And on that note, <laughs> <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to wrap up our first segment of the show. We're going to take a very quick break, but when we come back, we have some hands-on impressions. We've been playing Cuphead. We've been playing The Evil Within Two. We've been playing some Battle Royale and some other stuff. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This episode of the What's Good Games podcast is brought to you by TakeThis.org. Most of us spend a lot of time thinking about our bodies. Gain a little weight, lost a little weight, back hurts from sitting at a desk too much, stomach hurts from too much avocado. But how much time do you spend thinking about your brain? There are a lot of simple things that you can do every day to keep your brain in shape. Take breaks from work, get enough sleep, drink more water, put down those screens. Well, you know, as much as you can. Now, it sounds simple, but taking care of your body's needs can actually help your brain too because it's all connected. And sometimes your brain needs more help, and that's okay too. This is just one of the things that we learned from our friends over at TakeThis.org. Take This has been working to bring the mental health care community and the video game community together since 2012. If you or someone you love is feeling not okay and could use a little advice, visit them at takethis.org. And if you have the resources to donate or volunteer, 
takethis.org is where you can do that too. It's okay to not be okay. Take this. Welcome back, everybody. This is the second segment of the What's Good Games podcast. Um, I'm now staring at the eyes of Steimer's cat, Pumpkin. It shifted from Brit's googly pumpkin eyes to these evil cat eyes. He is evil. But with he's a very cute. with a very boss spiky collar. It's a he's did, a boss cat. It is did, a great cat. Did you name that cat? No. It does strikingly look like my two cats. It looks like your cats <laughs> slash the hashtagonist. Oh ah. yes, it does look like the hashtagonist. You wrote that on Patreon, and I was like. Oh my God, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, did you paint me a pumpkin? How nice of I'm you. Like, I'm like, yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, speaking of our patrons, we will be doing our turbo shout outs at the beginning of the next segment. But for now, let's talk about what we've been playing. So, Steimer, I saw you shaking your head. It was oh. an excited shake. Oh, <laughs> it was a this. Is that a you're so excited to talk about Cuphead? <laughs> um, am I? <laughs> Tell me how you really feel. <laughs> I feel like I want to love this game real badly, but, but it doesn't want to love me. Oh <laughs> no! No, it's fine. I haven't I haven't played enough of it to warrant a a strong reaction either way. I played a bunch with you ladies on our Patreon streams, um, but and then since then I've only gotten to play a little bit of it solo. I will say I do kind of find it easier. Well, it's easier and harder because you don't get the extra life. Are you talking about when you're playing it alone? Yeah. Alone versus like with you. Like when I was playing with you, there's a lot more happening, obviously, because there's two finger guns. Um, But at the same and you but you can parry me. But then it's easier to focus when there's just Mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Yeah. It's difficult game, but it's very charming. Um, and I don't, I don't want to say it's too difficult for me to enjoy. I've only played it um, at a few impressions. Uh, but have you gone events. to World Two? No, no, I haven't. And I've heard that the game just gets more and more difficult from what we've played. Oh yeah, it ramps up quite spectacularly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm really excited to play it more. I like the difficulty in the first world, but if it gets too much harder, I might have to revise. Yeah, that's what i'm worried about i would suggest playing through on simple mode for as far as you can or as far as you can stand it um so we played in co-op when we did our stream Mm -hmm. but i have to say that i found more success playing solo particularly in the levels that there's a lot going on because trying to coordinate your timing um, can be quite challenging and then you feel like you're spending most of the time trying to revive your teammate yeah which then you're not shooting the boss and then it takes longer but um i'm gonna stand firm with my statement that i think it's a little bit of a travesty that such beautiful artwork this hand-drawn meticulously crafted art the gorgeous soundtrack that fits so perfectly is not going to be seen by so many players because of its brutal difficulty. Now, I'm learning. I'm getting better. I'm on the second island. Fuck that roller coaster boss. He's the worst. <laughs> I'm saying that right now. <laughs> but, like, I, it's there's such an amazing sense of awe and wonderment when you walk into a new level for the first time. You get to see all of the little details from the little characters in the foreground and the background and the way that they did the art and how everything seems so perfectly themed. And they've done such an incredible job with it. But I just don't know why it's so hard. Yeah, that's an interesting question, right? Why did they make it so difficult? And, and it's, you know, generally, not always, but sometimes the game can be difficult because that makes it stand out. And it's like, this is kind of a selling point. Ha, look how brutal our game is. Dare you take the challenge? But with an art style and the music as it is, I feel like that's far enough, far more enough for it to stand out on its own. So it makes me wonder, if this game didn't have the beautiful art style it did, the the cheesy cartoony, and it looked like a regular platformer with high-def sexy graphics, would people be still talking about it? You know, it's interesting that you bring that up. You know, even if you just search, like I just did, why is Cuphead so hard in in Google, there is such a a, a diverse group of opinions because there's the people on one end that are like, 
that feel like me that are frustrated by it because it requires a set of skills that I'm just not particularly good at whether it's twitch reflexes or memorizing patterns or just having the patience to dodge things at the right moment and shoot things at the right moment and then there's people on the other side who are like I love how hard it is I've been waiting for a game that really pushes me to the limits and shows me just how difficult to be and that, that really are plotting the design in the way that it's done and I'm not saying it's broken or janky no. It's not. But there are certain things that they could do to alleviate some of the problems, particularly in simple mode, to make it more approachable. Because I think that they've really captured this art style and this tone and this theme of a game in something that could be so universally appealing to so many types of gamers that they've said, you know, well, we were really inspired by these tough games of the 80s, these shooters, Contra, things like that. And that's why it's so difficult because they really loved those kind of run and gun games. But I feel like they're... But it's not that year anymore. I, I know. Well, <laughs> we talked... I've talked about this um, when I was on the co-optional podcast with Total Biscuit. I was talking about how we, we understand, like, in that era, those games were difficult because it was an arcade era. So you were putting quarters in. So the developers of those games were incentivized to make sure that it wasn't easy so that you kept feeding your quarters in. We're not there anymore. You pay one flat price for the game unless there's loot boxes um and then you and then you can ex experience and enjoy the content they don't need to make it unnecessarily difficult just for the sake of being difficult you got my money i want to see the end of the game and not have to watch somebody else's let's play on youtube i want to experience it for myself let me experience it give me an e easy mode please well, not only that i think like yes games used to be harder but there were also fewer of them and so therefore you were more likely to spend your time on those games like even um on my snes like we had like four games total maybe and like the games back then were were you know harder and you didn't have really save files the way you do now or like mm. checkpointing or anything like that mm. um so but like it's just a different time now and you've got so many other options so like when you feel like you're running into a wall you're more likely to just bounce than you are to sit there and pers uh persevere through it which is what you would have done back in the back in the day, um, but now you're like me. I'm gonna well, move on to something else, yeah. and that's sad because this game was clearly made with so much love. And I will say, so granted, again, I'm only on Island One, so I don't know about this roller coaster bus, and you've made me nervous. But <laughs> oh, I'll show you. So I'll show far, you later. <laughs> so far, it's hard, but I feel like I am making progress. Mm -hmm. And that gives me like a little ray of hope that may soon be dashed to smithereens as soon as I reach the next it's place. It's hard, not impossible is what you're getting at. So far. So far. I don't know about this roller coaster thing either. Thing, <laughs> it is difficult, but I feel like I'm getting better at it. Except my main beef with this game is parrying. I feel like oh. parrying isn't parrying when I'm hitting the buttons the way I sh am. Sure. The, like the way that they've done parry in the game is maddening. What's the word I'm looking for? Maddening. Maddening is, is a good word. It's um, infuriating is Ooh, maybe the word that I'm yeah. looking for because the way that they parry is, and um, um, Laura K. Buzz on Twitter, she had uh, an article on Kotaku, I think, where she was talking about um, how she loves really tough fighting games and loves a good parry and talked about pixel perfect parrying and why that makes sense for certain games. But here, they really expect you to have like a pixel perfect parry, but because the hitbox is in the center of the object you're trying to parry, it's really difficult to time the parry the right way because you can't see what you're supposed to be hitting because it's surrounded by other pixels. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's why it's really challenging. And there are certain levels where like the thing you're supposed to parry is on the ground and it's this slap mechanic where your little character, you hit the button once and then you hit it again and he like his little hand comes out and like slaps the thing you're supposed to be parrying. But if it's on the ground, you do this jump first and then you are then you slap the thing. And I'm just like getting the timing of it is so difficult. It is. Did you do the mausoleum yet? No. Oh, girl, it's a whole level just of parrying. <sighs> Yay! <laughs> and like the thing that's annoying is like I feel like I'm I feel like I'm hitting it. Like I'm like, oh, OK, I'm parrying. Nope, didn't parry. And instead I got like minus one HP and now I'm just pissed off instead of feeling accomplished. And I don't know why. Like that, and that's the only thing about this game that to me feels slightly unfair or slightly mm. broken. Like I just think 
if they made some adjustments to parrying, I would probably probably be able to like get through the game fine. Well, and this goes back to what I was saying about an easy mode. Like, listen, leave the parry the way as challenging as you want it to be in the regular mode, but maybe offer a mode where the hitboxes on the parry are bigger. Maybe it only takes one. I know there's an upgrade you can buy where it only takes one hit instead of two pre button presses. Maybe make the player's hitbox much smaller and then the enemy's hitbox is much bigger. So that way it's a little bit more forgiving to people who want to play it and have a good time but don't necessarily want to die because it's a big tenant of this game. You have to die to progress. There is no way that you're going to get through this without dying the first time anyway. Obviously, speedrunners sure. are going to you know figure it out. But like if you open up, a, open up a level and you've never seen the level, never watched anybody play it, you don't know how to play it, you are going to die. And that's the way that the game is designed. And I find that design mechanic incredibly frustrating and i don't know why people like it i <laughs> Brit, do, do you do, like it no so <laughs> <laughs> who are you out there and why do you like dying in games i don't get it well it okay go so, ahead you go first but then i have a question for you after okay no all i was gonna say is like i was saying earlier you know I, you have to wonder like is this difficulty gonna deter people from playing the game generally i yeah. hate I, well, I well yeah, I don't like hard challenges. I don't like to feel frustrated in games, but I'm so compelled by the art and the music. I'm like, I have to, I have to play you. I must, and you know, we have codes provided to us. But if we did not get codes, I would have purchased it. So it's it's kind of a weird, it's it's a weird thing it, because of the music and the and the graphics. I'm like, okay, I I, ha I have to have it. I hate hard games, but I have to have it. And now they have my money and they're sitting pretty. But do you think they will implement easy mode? in the future i mean they're such a small team and from what i've heard the way that they designed the game on the engine that they're using because they're a pretty new team mm -hmm. they kind of did it in their own way and then once they brought in some people to consult once microsoft was like hey we're gonna feature this game you know we're gonna give you guys some assistance they brought in some other people and they're like whoa wait what how did you build this game mm -hmm. so apparently like the way that the code is designed on the back end is very like unique to their coding style yeah but what that means is that it's, it's not to easy changes. to make changes or to yeah. fix the changes. And they have since like learned from their, you know, not not necessarily a mistake, but like how other methods are probably more efficient for game making. Mm -hmm. And so if we're going to see any changes at all in the game, I would be pretty surprised. But I'm still hopeful. <laughs> I don't care if it comes out a year from now. I would play this game two, three, four years from now because I think it's got such a timeless quality to it that it could be a game you could enjoy 10, 20 years from now. Well, no one's going to complain about the graphics looking dated. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I see what Very you did there. Very true. Um, um, but Andrew, so you're talking about like games where you're basically, you must learn by death. Like that's just how it's designed. But I believe you also liked Ori in the Blind Forest. Yes? Am I making this up? No, you're not making it up. Okay. I did like that game. So that was another game. It's, it's slightly different, but there were moments in that game where I was just like, F this game. I, I controller almost throwing. threw my yeah. controller against the wall. I think I threw it onto the bed instead because I knew that <laughs> would do less damage. Um, but that has a lot of like timed events where you're you're never going to get that done the first try. Like You have to die. I think I probably died a hundred times in that first, like when you're, when the water is chasing you. You mean inside the giant tree yes. when you're going up? Yes. Oh yeah. That was brutal. Yeah. I remember specifically capturing a gameplay clip. I said, Xbox record that. Cause that was, a, <laughs> that was back when this, the, the connect was a thing. Um, and because I was so triumphant when I finally got to the top, I think, on that section alone, I had like 55 deaths. Yeah. Ooh, it, it was crazy. Because it counts your deaths for you in yeah, the game. Yeah, I don't remember how many mine was, but it was, yeah. I think, more than that. It, and so, like, I, I don't feel like, this maybe it's an uninformed opinion at this point, but I feel like maybe Cuphead's not as bad <laughs> in that sense. <laughs> I felt like Ori in the Blind Forest was challenging but fair, and I know some people feel that way about Cuphead. I feel like Cuphead is challenging, but because the design is isn't quite as tight and polished as it could be that there's there's little small things that make it not feel as fair as mm -hmm. or in the blind forest was and what those specific things are i would have to go back and like maybe do side by side comparisons sure but that's just my experience with those two games i much i experienced my time with ori much more 
than I have been with the gameplay of Cuphead. Like I actively am angry playing Cuphead. Oh, okay. But then I get to a new when I finally when I finally finish it, then I the whimsy of <laughs> of the music and these little characters just smiling at you all the time. And you're it's like, like oh. it calms you down a little bit. And then you get into the next boss level and you're like, oh my gosh, I hate my life again. <laughs> um it's it's such a dichotomy. I've never had a game make me feel this way before. Mm. It's a trap. Yeah. Yes. Graphics totally. are a trap. So, I mean, hats off to you for making me feel com- incredibly confused. <laughs> <laughs> I am um, both love you and hate you. It's like the same puberty time. all over again. Yeah. I definitely need to play more. But, um, Britt, yeah. you and I spent some time this week with The Evil Within 2. Oh, man. So, this game launches on Friday the 13th. Woo! Dun, dun, dun. Love and um, Bethesda provided us with some early access codes to check out the game. And we sat down. And we hadn't intended to play this for more than like 45 minutes or so. We were just like, hey, we got a lot of stuff going on. We just want to like check it out. And we played for like four hours straight. And it's so fun to play with another person. It's a single player game, very much so. But it's fun to play with someone else because you're like, okay, who's this person? What are we going to do this? Like I was, uh, I'm really bad at stealth, but Andrea was my coach. She's like, okay, crouch here. Go in these bushes. Throw that (laughs) bottle. Run. Shoot it in the face. It was great. (laughs) And I needed that. Even playing on, I think we're playing on casual mode is what we were playing on, right? Mm -hmm. Even difficulties? Yeah, there's multiple difficulties. This is the easiest. There's like four levels, I think. And with aim assist... We were like, yep, turn the aim assist on. You can (laughs) fight in this game. So I didn't play the first Evil Within. So this is my first time playing the franchise. And I really like it a lot. It's got such a great blend of action and like scary stealth mechanics and survival horror that you, that fans really know. So this is from Shinji Mikami, obviously, you know, the Godfather of Resident Evil. And he, when they made the Evil Within, you know, their big marketing push for this was like a return to true survival horror roots so that means like limited ammo you have to watch your resources your health is very low it's not like you can take a bunch of hits you can take a couple hits and then you're dead um you have to like run a lot stealth a lot craft Um, a lot craft a lot of craft so the crafting felt very resident evil right like down to like picking up the herbs and the gel and like it just like smacked of resident evil in that sense but not in a bad way no and i was getting the resident evil vibes while playing it and it was fantastic it has the slow atmospheric building there's houses you can go in and there's like a story told in every house like is there a body is there a woman shoving body parts into a man this did happen I'm sorry, yep what? it did um uh, she, she was him? he was a guy that was tied to a chair mm-hmm. and we couldn't tell if he was alive or dead or if she was a demon or if she wasn't a demon but she was t- she was force feeding him something as he was tied to the chair and it yeah. turned out it was body parts and it was really gross so this hmm. this game is freaky yeah. Like there are some disturbing stuff in oh, this yeah. game. Definitely rated M for mature <laughs> across all levels. There's a lot of swearing in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of really, um, I mean, like, like gruesome is a good word. Like some Lots of the of bosses mm-hmm. that you that we came across. Oh. We only came across a couple of mini bosses. Oh. but we were being chased by like a eight headed woman with a with a blade saw attached to her body. And then there were like these creatures. We called them like the multi-arm creatures. Cause they would just kind of skitter about and like, ugh, imagine like a spider, but the legs of the spider are hands. <sighs> and that instead of a spider head, it's like three human heads with eyes and mouths. <laughs> um, no. Yeah. No, it's real good though. So no. if you are a fan of, I would say resident <laughs> evil, it's, I mean, no. that's a dumb thing to say. But for me, as someone who missed out on the evil with them, but a huge fan of the Resident Evil franchise, like this definitely is, I feel right at home in this game. Yeah, what's well, so a, a little bit you of feel background right at home with the body <laughs> of this parts. story? I you, do. You, you you play once again as Sebastian Castellanos. Castellanos. Um, and he's going back inside this thing called STEM. It's we we likened it to kind of like the Matrix, where you like plug in and then you go to this like cerebral place and he thought that his daughter was dead turns out she's not dead this isn't story spoilers this is all like in the first like 20 minutes Mm -hmm. of the game um and you have to go back inside and try to rescue her and you meet this guy who we haven't discovered who his name is yet but he's taking these really weird um pictures that 
create these rifts in time. So when you walk up to them in the world, you see this like slow-mo violence happening, meaning like the first one we walked out to a guy had gotten shot through the head. And so in the slow-mo, you can see like the blood like nope. spraying out of his out of his head. And so when you walk inside of the little time warp bubble is when you can kind of get details about who he is, mm -hmm. what happened to him. And then um, – you kind of are trying to figure out like, who is this guy? Why is he taking these photos? Is he the guy yep. that kidnapped your little girl? Where is your little girl? And it's, it's, it's a, it's a mind fuck. It really is. Plot twist. It's the teacher from life is strange. Oh. Oh. <laughs> there was a point where we, it looked like we were in the upside down. Like I think it was a loading screen or something that looked very much like the, the solid black room with like the water on the floor. Oh yeah, and, you're right. I remember that. Um, it, it feels very much like upside down kind and of we were kind of rushing through it a little bit because we wanted to see all we could see but if you you could easily take hours of there's your time. a lot of exploration and there's files to find in the home so there's another story like aspect you could really deep dive into if you wanted to and i love that kind of thing so i love playing with andrea it was really fun but when i play by myself i think i'm going to take more time to explore to read everything that i can find out more of the backstory talk to everyone you know that's kind of my jam talk to people they yeah, won't, they yeah. won't kill you. Oh, not the enemies, but like there, there's, there's NPCs in the world. And they have dialogue. They're, like there's certain yeah. safe houses. Like, the, what the hell are you doing here? Get out. Well, I mean, they all <laughs> are free. tied to the story. Right. So without us like giving away like who these people are and what their role is, um, you know, there were there, there's specific people that you were in addition to your daughter that you're sent in to find. Oh. Um, so like you as Sebastian, like you're like, no, my primary objective is like to get my little girl and get out. But the people who sent you in are like, Hey, we sent you in. You have to help us recover X, Y, Z people. And mm -hmm. so you are trying to rescue these other people al along the way. Some of them you can rescue. Some of them maybe suffered a really gruesome fate. Uh, <laughs> you'll have to discover that for yourself. Yeah. Um, so are they like side missions or are they part yes, of the main? Yeah. Yeah, so you'll talk to certain people along the way and it'll open up side quests. So you'll pull up your map and you'll see these little beacons, you know, on the map of where these extra quests are. And so you have a radio. Um, and when you turn the radio on, when you kind of look or move it around the world, like it will pick up different frequencies and you can lock onto that frequency and walk in the direction of where that frequency is coming. Mm -hmm. Kind of like Fallout. That's good. Yeah. Um, and so you can then pick up like little side quests and it'll show you like if you go on the side quest, if there's a specific specific gun you can get if there's a specific resource or ammo type that's over there so like if you know like hey i love using the shotgun i want to go get shotgun shells you might want to go over there mm -hmm. because field crafting as we learned takes much more resources than uh, crafting at a table in a safe house but sometimes when you're in the middle of a fight you gotta craft a syringe or you're gonna die <laughs> i learned that the hard way <laughs> And, you know, there's skill tree things, so you can level up your weapons, your health, your stealth, your your stamina. You can do all of those things. It's good. It's it. really satisfying. And yeah. I didn't think that I would get into a game that's so focused on being scary and gory, but I'm really enjoying it so far. I mean, I think it helps that we played together, yeah. so I wasn't doing it, like, alone. <laughs> um, but... Um, it looks beautiful. It, it plays really well so far. The gameplay mechanics seem really polished, very mm -hmm. smooth, um, very, it didn't, it didn't, I didn't, nothing hitched for me at all. There was nothing that brought me out of the experience. Obviously we were, we were so immersed that we played for far longer than we were suppo supposed to and put off some of our other responsibilities. We did. Um, but it was a great time. So yeah. hats off to, to Tango and to mm -hmm. Bethesda for making a pretty excellent game. It's a good one. A surprise hit. Did not think I would enjoy it as much as I did. See? I don't think I'll play it because I don't want to play it alone. We could all play together. I would play it. Yeah. The only way I'm playing this game is if like you're holding my hand while we're doing it. <laughs> well, I mean, you would need to hold, have both hands on the controller probably. No. <laughs> <laughs> hold my hand, We'll, damn we'll it. get you a joystick. <laughs> It'll be fine. Um, so, Steimer, yeah. you and I, because of all of this crazy news that we've been hearing about Fortnite's Battle Royale, we decided, okay, we're Fortnite players. We've had a lot of fun playing in the regular mode of Fortnite. Let's jump in and check out th what this Battle Royale business is all about. Um, what did you think from your first run-in with the game? So I've not played PUBG, but I've watched a lot of PUBG. Like, I watch a lot of streams. I, I tend to watch videos. Um, so I am familiar with it. And I kind of know the general strategies of getting to the top ten or whatever. Not that we did, but 
<laughs> we, got we, we made it to number 17. That's so we good. went we went in as a squad. So they duos. have squads and duos we in Battle solo. Royale. Well, we we technically were a duo, but we we No, I switched s- it to duos. Oh, well then never mind. We went in okay. as a duo. <laughs> um but I thought it was interesting. I mean, the building aspect of it it makes it slightly different. Um <laughs> but I don't know. I, I Sorry, you go first because I'm like still formulating. <laughs> no, <words>. that's okay. <laughs> so uh, the biggest thing for me was I immediately just wanted to um, mine resources because in regular Fortnite, it's such a huge part of what you're doing is to have as many resources as possible because you have to build much more than you do in Battle Royale. But Cyber kept getting mad at me because she's like, they're going to hear you. Stop tearing <laughs> stuff down. And I'm like, look at this tree over here with my pickaxe. And, and she's like, like, stop it. Stop it. it. Um, so I was kept getting in trouble, but we did need, I mean, you have to get a few resources because there are, what they do is they strategically place certain guns and ammo up in high places where you have to build stairs to get up there, or you have to destroy like a wall or something to get at the resources behind, um, the barricade. And so it's a kind of like a risk reward situation. Like, do I want to, um, you know, mine for for things or do I want to run to the next house and try to just scavenge it for from from the open world um it's interesting clearly the art style is still in the same Fortnite art style but what that means is that there's no camouflaging right no in PUBG you can sneak real good Um, yeah you can like lay down on the ground and basically just commando crawl uh (laughs) yeah really slow but you can do it whereas you can crouch in Fortnite but I don't I I couldn't figure out a way to get completely down prone. On the yeah. yeah, and the the really unfortunate part is when you sprint, your character will have that little cloud behind you. So when you run really fast, it like kicks up like a little dirt trail behind you, and yeah. we could see those from yes. a distance from the other people in the world. I was like, ooh, someone's sprinting over there. Like that's a that's a really sad giveaway. And also, <laughs> like I granted, I can't think back to when I've watched people play PUBG but I feel like the footsteps are much louder in Fortnite like you can tell I knew that there was somebody coming up around the side of our building when we were inside of it just because like like you can kind of hear the heavy footsteps and I was like oh crap we better get your gun out let's go um and so I just I think it's interesting because there are it's much more I guess aggressive in a way because you can't hide as well because you do have to you are sort of forced if you want to find like better ammo better gear you need to build which is noisy which means people will come find you and probably try to kill you um so i I just thought that that was kind of interesting it's a neat it's not drastically different but i guess it's like it makes it different enough the thing that we didn't really get enough of a chance to experiment with was the traps so steimer did kill somebody in our first run together and they dropped a bunch of traps, but then we got ambushed by like three people. And so we didn't get a chance to actually set the traps up, but realistically I think it would be fun because there were so many little houses dotted across the countryside that if you were to find one of these, go in, loot it, build a ceiling trap, uh, because when somebody opens the door, they would be able to see the floor trap. But if you did a ceiling trap and they walked in, you could like zap them or something. That could be really great. But And that's what I've heard some other people having a lot of fun with is setting traps in the world. Yeah. But we just haven't made it far enough into the game <laughs> to actually build something uh, worthwhile that could kill somebody else. So the main Fortnite is all about building this amazing like tower of defense. But mm-hmm. in this, you don't really have the time to do that, right? Because the map shrinks. Yes. And if you build your stuff on the wrong side of the map, you're kind of screwed, right? Correct. Yeah. So you definitely have okay. to be aware of where the circle, where the storm, they call it in Fortnite, is is kind of mm-hmm. moving in on you. If you happen to parachute or paraglide into the right part of the map and you're able to fortify yourself or build a fortification off an existing structure or, or you're a very, very fast builder um, because you have to – I mean – Becoming an expert builder in Fortnite takes many, many hours of practice because there were there's building techniques that I'm still learning. And I've, you know, sunk a good like 40 hours into that game so far, which is a drop in the bucket compared to a lot of players. But um, is, you know, I thought was a decent amount of time. And 
I have yet to see where in the battle royale mode specifically they do any kinds of tutorials for that. Mm. Because I, in the regular Fortnite, there's several ways that they teach you how to build right. the structures and the complex ways that you can make really cool things. They don't do that in Battle Royale. Yeah, they just kind of assume that you know how to play the game already. Yeah, and they just drop you in. They don't teach you any of the menu systems or it's a anything. Free game. They don't need to give you any tutorials. Just figure it out. Figure it it's out. It's like PUBG. Run and hide until you're <laughs> until you're in the top and then kill a couple <laughs> people and win. So, Andrea, you guys had a great, like, I thought it was a great strategy anyway. You locked yourselves in a little stone looking hut and Steimer was like ready to go with her shotgun. That was when we, so we were in a spot where we heard a lot of gunfire. There were definitely multiple battles going on. And I was yeah. like, we need to get in this house and we need to stand here and hope to God no one comes but over. But someone can come by and like take down a, one of those walls. They could, right? but you would hear it before the, it does. It's not an instantaneous tear down. You would hear them and you would see the wall disintegrating. So we could have just easily pointed our guns at that wall. And I would have lived my life them. in that house. Yeah. That's the tough part about this game is that, and why I've struggled and I have played very, very little PUBG cause I'm waiting for the Xbox one release. But, um, just like it feels to me not like it's boring well it's a little boring mm -hmm. but it's just i would rather spend my time playing something that encourages me to be active in the world instead of encourages me to sit in one spot and wait for and wait it out did you right. hear about the guy who won in PUBG and he was afk and he was in a bathtub amazing like he just ran he was like he fired up the thing um, I think got called dinner and was like, oh crap. And so he just went into a house. He got into the tub, like laid down in it and then was just like, well, he just assumed he was going to die. Right. Cause what are the odds that he would make it into the tiny circle? It becomes at the very end. Well, <laughs> that's so funny. Those were like, he it came back and it was like, you won chicken dinner. So I guess my like question about that little stone hut was clearly you have the advantage, right? Like if someone opens that door, they don't know you're in there. Can't you just pop them off? Yes. Yes. So that seems a little unfair or is it not? Is not no, that's the, not that's the game. The game. Yeah. That's it. Okay. That's how I successfully killed two people in my first round of PUBG. I like saw them. I was in a house. I saw them running outside. I hunkered down in a room with my gun aimed at the door. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they opened the door, bam, shot him in the face, took all their stuff. Okay. And then the keys in to close all the doors to make sure no one thinks that it's been looted yet. And then you wait. And you just wait. And you wait. And you just keep waiting. <laughs> it is. You do I need to it. have <laughs> patience with these types of games. Because I think if you if you go too aggro, like there's there's a higher chance you're going to die. So you need it's patience. And I suppose patience playing duos, over. you could come up with some sort of strategy. Like you open the door and then you just immediately shoot and hope for the best. Right. There was one section where we saw some some good loot up high, but it would require us to like break down a bunch of like steel boxes. And Simon was like, no, it's too loud. I don't want to do it. And I was like, well, you can cover me. And then she's like, but I only have a shotgun. So I had a pistol, which is a more of a range weapon. So the, the, you break it down and I'll watch your back. Um, and, and then we got rocket launcher and then a girl out of, rocket out of launcher. nowhere RPG does. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I was like, <laughs> so that happens too. Cause there was rocket launchers. In I was Fortnite. like, where'd they get that? That That's was really crap. Funny. I was watching Simmer play and all I see is like the smoke just whiz by her head and big red. Poof. Yep. And then I saw, yeah, I saw you go down and I was like, <laughs> I wanted to see how quick the revive was. I was like, Spoiler. run, Steimer, run. It's slow. It's slow. Sh shouldn't have waited, but it's no. Fine. Yeah. I, w I was hoping it would be like a fast, faster. It barely moved when I was holding it. I was like, oh, okay. And but I um, I'm interested to play more. And yeah. obviously, you know, as I said already, I'm interested also to play more PUBG once it comes to Xbox One. Considering how successful both of those games are, I think it's, you know, showcases an appetite. And obviously, they're not the first. You know, Ark Survival Evolved has a mode that's very much like this. And there's obviously H1Z1. And, and we're going to see and more coming out. Like, obviously, every everyone is noticing PUBG right now. Everyone's going to want a piece of that pie. Yeah. Like, I'm sure that other games will start to add those modes in, too. Yeah. No, once GTA Online does, I mean, they ha kind of have something similar right now. But once they have, like, a true... Battle Royale mode. I mean, it's over oh. for PUBG. <laughs> no, I don't know. That, I don't know about if it's over, but I don't. I yeah. get the point. I don't think there's a way to kill that giant yet. No, no, they're they're on like this crazy snowball right now. It's growing in so fast by the day. Like it's 
it's hard to keep up with. Mm -hmm. So, but they'll hit a wall eventually. Yeah. yeah. But it, it'll be interesting to see how far down the hill that snowball is going to roll. That was good. That was a great analogy. Hey. Yeah. Thanks. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, that will wrap up our hands on segment for this week. When we come back, shouts out, shouts out, shout outs. <laughs> Is that what I, am I saying that right? Shout yeah. out. Perfect. Um, to our awesome Turbo patrons and above. Plus, we have a very interesting discussion planned. What is it? You're going to have to come back to find out. Stay with us. What's good, everybody? Welcome back. We are now in our special discussion. But before we get to that, I am going to read some names of some people. Some these people, people we are so grateful for. We are. Brittany, who are these people? These are our turbo patrons. And Woo! above. And above. So if you are interested in getting a shout out where we read your name out to the masses of people listening to the What's Good Games podcast, you, be you can become part of our Patreon community at patreon.com slash what's good games and become a turbo patron and get a shout out on our show. So without further ado, oh, by the way, this includes what Simer says above. Um, we have some higher level reward tiers, including our very cool IRL tier where you get snail mail from us. Mm -hmm. The one that Brit designed for October is amazing. Why, and I can't you. wait for you guys to get it. Um, we also have our awesome swag box um, tier. And if you guys even maybe just want to sign up for the month of November or the month of December to put together a cool holiday gift for a loved one or for yourself might be a thought maybe you want to go over there and check it out we um have gotten great feedback from people who've received our boxes and said that they're pretty cool they are very cool we put boxes. lots of swag in there yes. free games game codes t-shirts hats toys all kinds of fun stuff um and then of course we have our um sponsorship tier which if you're a big baller you know, <laughs> like take this, for example, the first person on our list. Uh, we also ha are sponsored by Mr. Alex Rogopoulos. Thank you so much for all of your sponsorship. Um, continuing down the line, uh, producer Lincoln Davis. We are going to be doing his topic, I believe, um, uh, either on next week's show or the week after. You guys will find out about Whoop. it soon. Cool. Continuing on, we have got David Iacolucci, Steven Insler, Tom Bach, Michel Villegas, Kia Bright, Josh Kerwin, Eric Ginn, Dustin Lewis, Tara Bruno, who we love, Kyle Heyman, David Cook, Stephen McPherson, Aaron J. Saxon, Benjamin Pardue, RJ Bryan, Elmo Shell, Bass Peterson, Carl Peterson, Molly Bittner, NH. Nam H. Bowie, sorry, if I totally butchered your name, my bad. <laughs> Jeffrey Hutchinson, John Drake, Chris Rhodes, Simon D., Bill Stilwell, Jason Erickson, Sam Baptist, Danny O'Dwyer of No Clip, Adam Rapone, Billy Shibley, Stephanie Fitzwilliams, Sam, Jason T. Barnes, Harrison Pink, Tommy Larson, Ross Haney, Jessica Salisbury, who is also the admin of the What's Good Guardians clan. Mike Lynch, Anthony McMurphy, or just Anthony Murphy. There's no Mick there. I totally threw that in by accident. <laughs> I don't know why. I just did. More M. <laughs> Doug DeChaser, Oswaldo Sandoval, Ethan Anderson, Gio Corsi, Greg Fletcher, Elijah Steele, Duncan Stanley, Trevor Starkey, Marcus Brown, Materia Attic, Joe Schleif, Annette Gonzalez, Ozzy Mejia, Christian Rodriguez, Troy Grayson, Moore Lewis, Creech Ron Mann, Donato Sinicho III, Adam Boys, Lee Kendall, and my mama, Teresa Enert. That is a good list of people. Yeah, that is, is a great list. It's a wonderful list. If you want to be on that list, head to patreon.com slash what's good games. We wouldn't be here without you guys. We love you so much. Thank you so much for all that you Thank do for you. us. Um, all right. So the discussion for today comes from our reader mailbag if you guys ever want to ask us a question email us contact at whatsgoodgames.com we may get to your question we might not just a disclaimer don't be mad if we don't get to your question it has nothing to do with the goodness of your question it really just has to do with what we have going on that week and if we have another spot filled mm -hmm. but this one we thought was particularly interesting it reads, Mario plus Rabbids is an amazing and weird crossover. What two franchises would you like to see crossover and in what genre? Anyone? I, I, I'm just going to agree with his original statement that Mario plus Rabbids is a weird, it is a really weird but charming out. crossover that is a really random genre for so, it. You're not going to get off that easy, Steiner. No, no. I'm, 
Yeah. So I have like I have notes and I'm I'm messing. It's like all noodling up here right now. I'm okay. just like it's noodling. <laughs> it is. So but Brittany said she had an idea. I, I have one because this is something I've wanted for quite quite some time now. Um, not necessarily the crossover, but what one cross what one game would bring to the other one. So something like Grand Theft Auto and Harvest Moon. Just think about it. Think about it. It makes perfect sense. So Harvest mm. Moon and its gameplay is so addicting, and I love the whole premise of it. Think of, like, Grand Theft Farming. Like Wait, so are you, it, like, jumping other farmers and stealing their horses? And- absolutely. Why not? Well, you don't have Well, yes. So here's what I want, is I've always wanted a mature-themed Harvest Moon game because that game is, like, you know, it's like you're living another life. They throw you in this shit show a plot of land and it's like hey good luck you know go pick some herbs and sell them and maybe make some money and then maybe you can buy some potato seeds and then befriend everyone get a chicken marry someone have a child and that's great and it's actually really fun it's a very great escape however it's always such a a very uh child friendly game Mm -hmm. that and this is something i really liked about stardew valley is it it tackles some more mature adult issues you want to murder people if someone tried to steal my chicken (laughs) If my wife cheats on me or my oh. husband cheats on me, I want to be able to do something. But there's they don't infidelity ever... no. in Harvest Moon? No, 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 no. But I want like these things to be you like. You want infidelity in Harvest I want Moon. some deep <laughs> shit to happen. If one of my cows I dies. I want to be virtually cheated on because real life's not. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think there's a, it's because it's you are so absorbed in this other life that if they could include some mature themed and, and topics and whatever, I think it could really open up like a real branch. Like I might want to go to the bar one night and get shit faced, which is something you can have alcohol in Harvest Moon games and story season games. But well, I don't know if you can anymore. You used to be able to. You can in Stardew Valley. Or the other thing is, you know, you romance people in these games. But the romance is you give them like a turn up a day and they're your best friend. But, you know, make it more realistic. Give me dialogue options. Can like, I give you a turn up every day? Andrea? Show me some sex. Do I, does it have to be a turn up? No, it no, can be it whatever depends. gift you want. Whatever you want. Okay. It can be a walnut, I like gifts. a potato, an egg, a I gallon like eggs. of milk. I'll give you every an day. egg day. An egg a day. You notice. Know, I'm going to get my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna send you an egg every day. So essentially, I want Harvest Moon with mature. Could it beans. be chocolate eggs though? Yeah, N- I'm no. gonna send you a picture of a chocolate egg every day. <laughs> what? Is that how you get your affection with Andrea Renee? Send her a picture of a chocolate egg every day. Please don't start sending me pictures of eggs. <laughs> I don't need that in my life. <laughs> so that's what I want. I, I wanted that for a while. Make it happen, someone. So I had one thought, and I'm probably gonna come up with other combinations here, but. My first instinct naturally went to a Mass Effect slash Dragon Age crossover in the form of a dream daddy. <laughs> Wait, what? In the form of like a dating simulator, like a, just a straight up dating simulator. So you want a Mass Effect dating sim or you uh, want no, a Dragon Age Effect, dating sim? The crossover is Mass Effect and Dragon Age, meaning you would have characters from both franchises. So it would be a Bioware dating sim. Pretty much. And then like made in a similar way that Dream Daddy was. Like I like the style that they did art style and i like that they threw in some random elements like when you're verbally battling over children and it's sort of like a pokemon battle hmm interesting if it was a vr bioware dating sim would you play it i would play it on my regular computer looking at the screen the same way that i play all of my other dating simulators currently so you would have to pick between you would have to pick one bioware boy or would you yeah interesting or unless it's like unless actually no because dream daddy technically i banged the version of you oh you did but i don't think you're gonna romance me no so (laughs) he's like no 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 (laughs) you don't even know but i don't think so (laughs) so like i think technically you could do that like where you sleep with multiple of them but you pick one ultimate so has bando or waifu here's a question because if you look at the bioware and dragon age Dra- bioware dragon age dragon age and mass effect <laughs> games they're kind of you could think of them as one big giant romance sim yeah but there's a bunch of other stuff on the way so you would just get rid of all of that <laughs> and it would all be about just building. for a cro- like just for like if we're talking about a standalone little side piece <laughs> not in that way but like in the way but that mario that way. plus <laughs> rabbits okay is its own weird little offshoot this would be its own weird little offshoot. I'm not talking about getting rid of the Dragon Age franchise or Mass Effect franchise entirely. No. But okay, I think this would be like a fun little rando thing. Fair enough. Hmm. Okay. I'm, I think I could be into it. I don't really like Sims. They're not my thing. Um, I used to like them way back when I played on PC like ages ago. But 
I see what you're going for. Yeah. Um, I think I would do something much more action oriented. I really love um, what Fortnite has done with combining third person shooting with tower defense. Um, cause most tower defense games are 2d, um, um, at least most of the ones that I have played recently. If you know of a 3d good tower defense game, hit, hit a girl up and let her know. Um, but I would like to do like kind of like that 3d tower defense base building, but in a different universe. So like maybe like. It would be really cool if Fortnite crossed with Paragon, like the two games <laughs> cross together. Is that bad? That is such an Andrea answer. No, it's not bad. Well, you talked about Harvest Moon. Well, that was a very pretty but answer. But she also did GTA, whereas like yours is closer to mine, where it's like it's just from the same developer. <laughs> well, I mean, but they're two wildly different types of games. But like if I could bring like the heroes that I know and have played so many hundreds of hours with in Paragon, like into this other world where we could it could be more of a cool cooperative experience instead of just like kill all the minions and kill all the heroes. That's just like a skinning thing, right? You just want like basically Fortnite but with the skins from Paragon? Yeah. Okay. But I wouldn't mind having... Epic. I I think this is doable. I wouldn't mind having the objectives that are in Paragon of having to like, you know, with the wave clearing and the tower destroying and all that. Mm -hmm. Like the MOBA part of it. How it's more action oriented and it's more about like what? No, sorry. No, keep going. I'm just oh. like, this is, you, when I point at you, it's like, I have something. You have a mind. You, you have come, an idea in your mind. Come back to me when you're done talking. <laughs> um, <laughs> when you're done talking. Um, the, so I just don't like the enemies in Fortnite. I think the husks are kind of like generic and I don't think they're original. I don't think they're inspired. I think they're such throwaway enemies. But I think, not that the enemies inside Paragon are better, but at least the minions and like the jungle creeps and you know, they've got, you know, the Orb Prime Guardian are, like, have a little bit more going on stylistically from an art perspective than the than the husks do. So, um, I guess I just like the art style in Paragon much better. That's but a I, crossover. That counts. Yeah. When you were talking about, like, the objectives carrying over, my immediate thought was... Um, it would be interesting to add that to the PUBG mode, to the Battle Royale mode, to have more objectives because then it would be more like what you were saying where it's encouraging you to be more active and not really just like hide in the house until everybody dies. Right. No, that's what I would, that's what I would like. Uh, something more Hunger Gamesy, where there's like specific caches that you can all go for and they're like timed or some, something that's on the map that incentivizes you from laying in a bathtub and winning by doing nothing, <laughs> which to me is like complete bullshit. The idea that that could even happen, that they wouldn't time you out after a certain amount of minutes of you not moving at all. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, this is when we talked about this as a discussion point, I didn't have enough time to properly think of, of something that would be a really great mashup. But I, every time we do these discussions on the show, when I as soon as we're done taping, I'm like, oh, I thought of the most genius idea. Why don't I talk about that on the show? And um, so I know I'm going to think of something as soon as as soon as we hit the stop button. Okay. I haven't thought of like a a crossover game with it, but I would like to see just because we were talking about Bioshock earlier and it got me thinking about how much I loved that game and how much I love that art style. And I was like, I'd love to see that in different forms. Like, so it's going to sound really weird, but like a Bioshock JRPG, but like huh. with pixelated art style, I would actually kind of like that. Why does it have to be pixelated? I don't, cause I think it would be, oh, I think that would ruin, I think that would ruin the art style. Get our friend, get our friend, Papa Joe over there. So you like the design, not the art style. No, I love the art style too. I'm just saying I'd like to, I like mixing things up. I like taking different art styles and, the, and applying them to um, different franchises. So I just think it would be interesting to see it. I think that Papa Joe, our big daddy friend here, <laughs> would make a really <laughs> adorable pixel art yeah, character. Yeah. yeah, I don't disagree. I guess I just like, I'm so over retro art styles. Oh, just I'm, so I'm over always it. a big fan. No, you're not alone. There are <laughs> lots of people out there that love it. I think I'm just like I, I I like stuff that's a little bit more original. And I love the the art direction and the tone um of of Bioshock. And I I would love to see more from that from the original Bioshock from Rapture like mm -hmm. specifically. Yeah. Um. I really like not to say that Infinite 
or Bioshock Columbia. 2 weren't like good games in their own way. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, Bioshock Infinite more than two, but um, I actually don't think I played Bioshock 2. I played Infinite. You could probably s never play it and it's okay. <laughs> it's it's not one of those things you would need to go back to. This is and, an interesting topic. And I feel like if you do come up with something after we press stop, we can revisit this maybe in a few weeks too because I could think of some interesting ones that we could talk about. Do you have one out off the top of your head right now? I was thinking like Resident Evil and Skyrim could be kind of interesting. Some people Whoa, like, oh, like an open world Resident Evil game? Yeah, and some people might be like, oh, so basically Fallout, no. There's no zombies. No. In the fallouts. Well, well maybe there are. Yeah, there are I, don't, I didn't play. Yeah. yeah. Ghouls are, are zombie-ish. And so this is why I'm really yeah. looking forward to some of these Close. upcoming zombie titles we have is because I've always craved like, it's like an open world zombie survival, not survival, horror. I don't really want to have to survive. I don't want to have to like eat food to like live and play this game. That just stresses me out. But more of like, you know, there's this huge world. It's all gone to shit. There's this T-virus that's broken out. And here's all these, like, towns that are in settlements that are scattered throughout this huge world. Like, go find, explore, and uh, just find some people hold up, some people living their life. I don't know. I think it would be awesome. That's what I want. That's another one I want. That could be really cool. <laughs> Getting all hot and bothered thinking about it. I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> like, the wheels are spinning. I was trying to think of something because Mario, when you think about Mario plus Rabbids, mm -hmm. the Rabbids games – are like as far away from um, real time strategy or um, I mean like what's the what's the genre for XCOM that I'm I'm not getting right? Um, it's not it's, it's top it's turn based strategy. Turn based, turn -based. yeah, turn -based. that's it. Yeah. Um, so that's what I was missing there. Um, so none of the Rapids games are like turn based games. Mario also not. No, I mean, there's yeah. a couple like iterations DDS that incorporate and, yeah. some turn based stuff, but I mean at, at its core, that's a platforming game, right? Right. Um, and so, like, what they did was kind of create this genre that neither of these IPs were ever thought that they could be in. Mm -hmm. And they've made this really unique m hybrid thing. Um, and I was trying to think of what could be that thing. And maybe I'm just... It's maybe like, I'm just it's not creative difficult. enough, you guys. It's not like... I feel like that game was concepted off a really bad acid trip because I don't know <laughs> how you could possibly think... Number one, to put those two franchises together is one is one step, right? Mm -hmm. And then to be like, but wait, it's going to be a turn-based strategy like XCOM. Like, what? And then somebody greenlit this game? Like, come on. Like, it's and I love, and that's not me crapping on the game. I think it's wonderful. But I just am like, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall in the room where that meeting, like, where that was pitched. Because I can't imagine that the initial reaction was like, totally, that'll work. What about, I'm just throwing this out there, Andrea, like Mass Effect and Call of Duty. Like They're a first-person Mass though. Effect shooter? First-person, like super story-driven cinematic experience. I would love that. I would play the shit out of that. That would be amazing. You would want it to be first-person? Yes. Okay. Because let's be honest, of all the things that Mass Effect did well, the third person shooting was not really one of them. <laughs> I always had a thing where I kind of wished it would go, it would stay third person for the most part. And then in combat, like you would, I don't know, like tap on your Omni thing and then be like, bloop, and it would go to first person shooting. But what if it was like Destiny where, I mean, if Mass Effect, if there was like a Mass Effect Destiny, that would be way better, actually, now that I'm saying this out See, loud. I get the wheels turning. Because imagine you've got the Omni tool, right? The Omni blade or whatever that you're mailing with, yep. or depending on which character you are, maybe you're using something different. But because in Destiny, it's all first person until you, um, use your special and then it goes it briefly goes third, third person, person for a second so you could potentially map special powers like if you have your biotic powers or whatever on your character mm -hmm. then it would briefly go third person but for the most part all the shooting mechanics were first person that's a good point yeah oh, imagine if you actually got to see the sniper like in in through the actual eyepiece instead of oh yeah <laughs> no that could be so good this oh, just makes me think of now Anthem. i want mass effect destiny see and i'm like yeah well De destiny tries a little bit i think to be i always think my hunter looks remarkably like a corian some of the some of the armor yeah well it's very like you know sci-fi in that in that sense but like there's none of the 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 story, story depth, like, really right? The that's in, that's in that Mass like Effect that, that appears in Destiny. Like, yeah. imagine going to a social space like the Tower. I mean, they've got this, you know, in Mass Effect, it's like the Citadel and mm -hmm. various other spots. Mm -hmm. But 
but having those conversations, um, having the graphics be of the quality that Bungie made, um, having the skill trees that Mass Effect or the uh, conversation trees that Mass Effect does be in like the NPC with the NPCs in uh, in the way that you interact with the NPCs that would be in cool. Destiny. Yeah, especially with the um the reputation system that they have. Yeah. If it tied in there. We're on to something, ladies. Oh my gosh, if Bungie and Bioware can just get together and make, make some babies this happen. Honestly, Bungie could do this on their own and they could do it with Destiny, but not the way it's built right now. No. But that's why they need to, you know, Maybe, like, get together, have some drinks. Have some drinks with Bioware. Have some drinks <laughs> with Arena Net. Make a sweet baby. <laughs> We're all over it. <laughs> um, so, clearly, hopefully listening. <laughs> clearly, hopefully listening. <laughs> That's three English. words that should yeah. go together. All of the adverbs. Um, when you've been uh, listening to this discussion, you've maybe thought of something yourself. We'd like to hear it. Um, leave a comment on this video if you're watching it on YouTube.com slash What's Good Games. Tweet it to us. Mm-hmm. Put it on our Facebook page um, in the comments there. Or, of course, you know, emails. Let us know what your mashups would be. We'd love to hear them. Um, and thanks so much for listening. I think we're going to wrap it up for this week. Um, if you guys are listening to this on Friday... And you happen to be in the Tulsa area. Don't forget, we're going to be at Expo um, in Tulsa at the Convention Center. We're going to have our panels on Saturday. Please come down and uh, and visit us. We'll take some pictures and we'll, we'll do a little video and, and post some things for all the folks who are not in the area. And um, we have some, you know, cool announcements coming up later in the month. Um, I believe our merch store is almost ready. Ah. It's so close to being ready, you guys. We're super excited about it. And um, another big thank you to the hashtag and for creating one of our original T-shirt designs. Yes, it's um, so cool. It's really and don't great. worry, once it's live, we'll we'll spread the news wide and far. Um, but thank you so much for listening. Um, and one last thing, if you guys have not yet subscribed, it's okay. You can keep playing with the Big Daddy. If you have not yet subscribed to our podcast, we would love it if you would. If you haven't left a, a rating or a review, we'd love that as well. The girls are now playing with the toys on set. Yeah, it's, it's going off the rails. So I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you again. Have a great weekend, everybody. Mwah. We love you. Bye. Waving my arm. Okay.